Hey guys, it's me. I'm back in my office and in my studio. I'm really sorry about all of the audio and video issues um, that were on the last video, so I'm going to go ahead and redo it because um, I want the I want you guys to really enjoy the content that I'm giving you. You know, I don't do this um, for any sort of cost on my end. I do this because I like what I do. I like to um, bring this information out to you guys and. I really like talking about this stuff and I hope that you guys really get some good information from what I talk about. So without further ado, this is the redux of shootings, Bernie, but no empathy. Why? So number one is the shootings. Let's talk about it. So we all, um, you know, we all know now about the Parkland um, High School, well, it's not called Parkland High School, but it's Parkland, Florida High School um, that was attacked by a terrorist, basically, and 17 lives, uh, 17 plus lives were lost, countless more affected by the shooting itself. You know, we all have, you know, seen the posts about the kids protesting now in Washington. And it all, you know, really just became sort of real for me. Um, yesterday, um, I had to go to my daughter's school because my daughter had an accident. I had to go get clothes for her and I had to take her to the school. Luckily, it's not that far from the house. So, um, I, what I did, luckily it's not that far from the house, so I got in the car, went to the school, and we, you know, I gave her the clothes, it wasn't a problem, and she went to her class, but I was stuck. I was stuck at her school because my car broke down. So I took the opportunity to look around to see what I could see, you know, from a mother's perspective that I could see as far as the going ins and outs of the front office, which is basically the, the um, one of the um, first lines of defense when it comes to people being able to come in. When I went to the school and when I go to the school, um, I had to ring the doorbell. They answer it. I have to you know give my name and my child's name and what I'm there for. Um, so that's like every time I go there. So. I saw that as, you know, a good thing. And when you have, you know, when you're you know, trying to do some nefarious stuff, people can tell that right away by your body language. And I actually got a call too from the principal of my daughter's school saying that they actually are on high alert with active police presence until further notice. So that, that comforts me. Um, but that's not like an everyday thing. So. I will be contacting the superintendent to see what their training is as far as emergency drills and, and stuff like that in case of an active shooting situation. Um, and every parent needs to do that. Every parent, every, you know, sibling, you know, if you're, you know, taking care, you know, whoever is caring for, you know, someone else, you know, and your dependent has to work with a nurse, a teeth, you know, a, a school, a um, assisted living um, facility, make sure they know what their um, training, like their, um, the emergency drills are for that situation. And make sure, yeah, you ask, because if you don't ask, they probably won't tell you. And they probably won't even open the conversation if it's not available already. So the, 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 you know, dealing with that and looking at everything, it really made me think about it and what is really ticking me off about the whole way that we're approaching the topic of the shooting itself. Because first and foremost, we need to think of the direct victims of this attack. The students that were killed, the students and staff that were killed, um, the students and staff that were injured and then um, the families that were affected directly 
by this because their family member, friend, coworker, um, loved one, you know, partner was, you know, injured or killed because of it. And those of us with traumatic, um, you know, issues going on that had been triggered or those that basically felt traumatized with, you know, memories of their own, you know, that are filled with gun violence that can be triggered. You know, if it's people living with PTSD, if they were triggered by um, what Donald Trump was saying with, you know, the different reports of the shooting, things like that. And it's difficult to talk about sometimes, but we do have to keep the conversation open. And the problem that I'm having um, a lot of times when it comes to social media is the fact that there's a, this cycle, there's a big cycle, it seems like, of complacency when it comes to difficult topics of um, tragedy, whether it comes to police brutality, mass shootings, a celebrity death, a, um, you know, whatever. The, or, you know, they're, you know, someone that they know on social media going through something, you know, it's a cycle, you know, just like the different stages of grieving. And it's like, first one is we are given the situation, excuse me, we are, so number one, the situation is put in front of us. We are shocked. We are sad because it's a sad situation. Next one. We are sad for that person. We're sad for the people around them and, and, and so forth. We, we, that, that moment is the only thing that I see as far as empathizing with people, but we'll, we'll get more into that later. And then there's anger at whoever did it, whoever, you know, whoever actively took part in it. And then there's anger in what allowed them to be able to do that. There's love, there's thoughts, there's prayers, there's online petitions, there's um, rants in social media posts, long ones about what you feel and what you have and that is all well and good until we get to the next one. Nothing. You don't post about it. You don't talk about it. The issues that are surrounding the situation are still there. But you, it doesn't really matter. Because you've moved on. They haven't, but you have. And then something else happens. And the cycle goes on. Now... Let's say we apply that to real life to see just how ridiculous that is. Let's say I'm driving in my car and I run over someone's foot. Okay, I get out the car. Oh my goodness. The person's hurt, they're grabbing their foot and they drop, let's say they, they had groceries with them. And there's groceries all over the store, they're all over the floor, you know, all over the ground, you know, eggs broken and they're holding their foot saying, ow, 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 oh my god, I'm not going to be able to walk, I'm not going to be able to take care of my mom, that's why I have the groceries, oh my goodness. That's me saying, oh my god, I'm so sorry, I'm so sorry, oh my god, your grandma, oh my god, your poor grandma, damn me, for driving damn. on the road, damn me, damn me for having a car, damn me for driving. And then I go on and I run over someone else's foot. Is that how we're supposed to be reacting to things? Is that how we're supposed to really be addressing these situations? I don't think so. And it screams of how complacent we've gotten. I come from the generation that had to deal with Columbine, Virginia Tech, you know, um, a lot of, a lot more graphic, you know, um, special effects, violence, and stuff like that. And we never really had a really um, big, you know, opinion about it. It was just cool in the movies. You know, watching Terminator, watching Last Action Hero, uh, Kindergarten Cop, 
you know, things like that. We loved it. We didn't care about it. And there, it was just that, it was just how it was. And when things happened, like, and, and we lived through, we were there, you know, and, and, and complete and, and able to, you know, digest what happened in 9-11. We were old enough to be able to digest what happened in 9-11. So, the, I want to say the emotions weren't, like, ignored, because they weren't, and they still affect us, but it's just, like, part of us is, okay, whatever, and part of us actually does feel something like that's not right so we know that it's not right but now we see it happening and i mean i guess there was like a, a certain i guess there was a certain you know a aura of maybe it'll stop maybe it'll get better but to a certain extent it doesn't you know and we can all see now that it hasn't and i would love for it to be different you know, I, I really would. I would love for, you know, to be able to wake up tomorrow and not see anything like this happening. But it does happen. And we have to be able to have these conversations. We have to be able to open up dialogue. Because another person that was a victim was a shooter. The assailants here are, are also victims. I'm not going to say they're as much of a victim as those that they hurt. That, those that they hurt. But there comes a point where you have to stop. There's another cycle involved here. And that's a cycle of violence. And there comes a point where you have to really step out and get your own feelings out of it and see everything for what it really is. And that's why I love being an independent as far as uh, politics and intellect. Because you can look at things at all sides. You can take a step back anytime you want and really look at things objectively. So I look at um, the shooter objectively here and I see that he was trying to enact some sort of violent fantasy that he held on to. And he was able to do that. Quite frankly, I don't think he had any remorse because he tried to escape within a crowd of people that he just basically traumatized and or injured. So it, I want to be able to open that door and say, you know what, we know that you're hurting, but he is responsible. So I'm not going to take that out. You know, you don't just get a free pass because you, 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 got hurt when you were a kid or your parents were abusive. I get it. It's not an excuse because there are people that are going through that that don't shoot people, you know. But we have to be able to understand that society failed him too. He fell through the cracks somehow and we have to be able to identify that. So when we talk about shootings like this most recent one. We have to be able to say that we don't know everything. We don't know the statistics surrounding gun violence because NR the NRA and other gun lobbyists are making sure that scientists don't really investigate to the extent that they need to. We don't have all of the information that we need to. We don't have all of the information about what guns are where. There's so many things going on in the black market regarding guns that our government may or may not be involved with that we just don't know about. And all we can do, you know, I guess on the outside looking in is think and pray. But there's so much more that we can do. We can research. We can look at different aspects of things that maybe scientists may not be able to make studies about, but it's something that you can bring up to your local and state lawmakers. You can talk to your school and go there and witness 
their front office relations, being able to see visitors in and out. See how the day-to-day -day is, not in this high tense situation where police um, may be there. Wait until this is over and go to your, your, go to your child's school. Wait till this is over and go to your uh, grandma's nursing home. Wait till this is over and go to your sister's college. You know, of course those are hypotheticals, but I'm being serious. Go there and see how things are. And if it's not up to a standard of safety and it leaves holes for people to come in, then do what you need to do to get your voice heard. Because this is what's stopping, you know, regulations from being made lo in local and state governments. This is what's keeping us, you know, blind to seeing that the federal government has every opportunity to be able to instill what schools and other public services need to be able to keep the people that they provide services to safe while they're in their building and their employees. You know, there there's things available that we can do to make sure that people stay safe. There's things available that we should be able to do that would keep, um, that would stop the cycle of violence and stop the cycle of poverty that often turns into violence and stop the cycle of enabling and basically endorsing mental health issues with trauma. It's, we can do it. Don't tell me it can't be done. If you want to know more about what I think about the, the shooting situation, I am going to be um, hopefully publishing my shooting article um, within, you know, I, I'm hoping within the week or, you know, within the next week. Um, not in my hands right now because I just sent it off. But I will be sending um, and sharing it um, on my page, um, The Musing Monster, and it will be shared on The Real Progressives on their website as well as their Facebook page. So make sure to keep a lookout. Okay, so we're on to number two which is Bernie. I know that you guys have been looking forward to talking about this, and I'm looking forward to talking about it with you guys. Feel free to leave your comments about the situation and what you feel happened. But I'm gonna give my, my opinion from start to finish. So in the 2016 election, we saw that Bernie was basically a um, coming out of the woodworks um, to challenge Hillary Clinton for the Democratic um, nomination for president and we knew we you know barely knew anything about what was going on and me personally i was not involved until until i think things were about halfway underway with the primaries and i knew about bernie and i knew what he was standing for and i supported what he was standing for but something didn't seem right um and i didn't really know much about him enough to make a real like grounded decision about you know who I'm going to vote for. So I said, you know what? I'm going to wait. I'm going to wait it out and see what happens. Then I saw all the shady things that happened to his campaign that and it was I I saw it from the outside, you know, I didn't have much information about that. Um, other than what of course the mainstream media was saying and I was just like, you know what? I need to find out more. And that's when I found out about Real Progressives, the same progressive, the same progressive, um, um, cause I was, I think the only, uh, independent media that I was watching was the Young Turks at the time. And I had found out about, um, Redacted Tonight and all this kind of stuff. But then I was able to look for further into it. And that was around the time that Bernie had switched sides. So I was already done. You know, he was, he was dropped. And then he switched sides and was supporting Hillary. And let me tell you why I never supported Hillary. It's not because she's a woman. It's not because she um, 
it's not because strictly of Benghazi and all these different things like her emails and all that. No. What did it for me was her election campaign in 2008. When I, that was, I was 20 years old in 2008 and it was going to be my first election that I was going to vote in. So when the speeches, um, like the debates came on, I watched them and you could tell, like you could really just see the arrogance from her. And the way that she was portraying herself, it was very fake. It was not authentic at all. She was changing herself to um, meet the audience, you know, who she was giving a speech to. And she really didn't really do anything to earn the votes. And it showed. And Obama was president. In my mind, he got more votes because she was a lousy candidate. And I knew that then. <clears throat> I knew that then, and really nothing has changed. So, I'm, as far as why I didn't vote for her in the 2016 election, I saw the same thing. She was not doing a lot to really win her vote. She was arrogant. She changed and, and behind, you know, the main doors, either her or her supporters were just as arrogant towards people that were saying something that maybe they didn't want to hear. Like when the Black Lives Matter protester had shown up without, you know, without warning to her campaign uh, meeting or campaign dinner, some campaign um, event. I think that was, I, I wanna say it was in her home, but I'm, I'm gonna say no, but I don't know. But either way, Black Lives Matter protester came into there and demanded her to explain her super predator comment. That's a valid question. And she has had to address it because it's a valid question. And what pissed me off was that the supporters there were mostly white and they basically told her to go away and they didn't want to hear from her. But you're with her? Why are you with her? Why are you supporting her? Why, what, who do you hope to be able to help? And how do you hope to be able to help when you can't even listen? You know, and that goes with every candidate. You cannot hope to do anything if you don't listen. And you can't do anything if you don't hope to just take your own self out of it. One of the biggest, you know, con um, contractions from her being able to have my vote is her arrogance, like I keep saying. She didn't believe that she needed Bernie votes. She wasn't going to change a damn thing to bring, bring liberal um, independents on her side or the Bernie voters to her side. That tells me everything that I need to know about her. The arrogance on its own. But I can, I can add on like eight more. Let me see. Her marriage to Bill. Just the marriage. Bill cheating on her. The way that she handled the election in 2008, the death threats towards Obama in that time, her reluctance to drop, you know, resistance, but her forcing Bernie to stop resistance. You know, the sort of hypocrisy that she keeps doing, that it's okay if I do this when I'm in trouble when I'm losing, but the, it's not the same thing when it comes to anybody else who's running against me and I'm winning, quote unquote, on winning, or I have enough money to go over you, excuse me. So, <sighs> oh, and don't forget that she did get a job within the state, the state department, and she fucked that up too. Benghazi, 
Haiti, yeah, we see you. Don't get mad that we see you. Do something different. That's all that you've got to do, is just do something different. So when Bernie came along, I wanted to really be happy about it. But when he changed sides to Hillary Clinton's side, I was just like, he, you know, maybe he was forced to. You know, that was, that was my opinion. He was forced to, you know, they had something on him, you know, and they were threatening exposure. But now he's double back, you know, backpedaling and trying to basically sweep, sweep everybody under the Russia rug. And what point does that prove? What point are you trying to prove by saying that all people that voted for Jill Stein, including myself, are Russian propagandists? What point are you trying to prove? And how dare you? You know, we fought for you. I may not have put money down for you, but every time I saw something bad that was going down against Bernie by the DNC and any of their other lackeys, I vouched for Bernie Sanders because he was one of the only candidates that actually was trying to make a difference. Other one was, in my mind, Jill Stein. So I voted for her. And realistically, if you want to say that the people that voted for Jill Stein are some sort of attack, you know, some sort of weapon being used by Russia, there's only 2% according to the Gallup poll that voted for Jill Stein. True, polls may have been, you know, finagled with, you know, voter fraud and all that, voter rigging, gerrymandering, whole nine. But if we take that as, let's say that's the, that's the truth, let's say that this is the truth, just for, just for example's sake. How is that going to help? 2% of the population, and let's say on top of it, the 300,000 Facebook ads compared to billions and billions and billions of dollars being spent on a political campaign. How is that different? How is that, how is that, you know, compare, comparable? How are you going to say that that is why you lost? Because, I mean, that's saying that we have a lot more power than you thought. That's saying that we had a lot more power than you were expecting. But at the same time, they gave more airtime to Trump than anyone. If they want to sit here and talk about anyone being a Russian propagandist, ever since the election, you know, and Hillary's, you know, numbers going down, Russia has been the name on everybody's list in the D the, the Democratic Party. So if anything, you guys are populizing Russia, just like you did with Donald Trump. Because if you didn't talk about him so much and you didn't act like y'all were high and mighty and didn't need the middle class, didn't need the working class on your side, Trump won to one. If you didn't act so high and mighty and think that you can't win with Bernie, Trump won to one. Talking now and trying to spin everything to be Russia, 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 that's not gonna work. Change your tactics or be ready to leave because we're fed up. And Bernie, you can go right along with them. We are not Russian propagandists. And if everything that goes against the mainstream is Russian, you really have a lot to learn about what goes against the mainstream. It's pathetic that everything that goes against the mainstream in politics is against the government. It's not against the government. I'm against the corruption in the government. I'm against the hypocrisy 
in the government. I'm against the white supremacy in the government. I'm against the classism in the government. I don't really have an opinion about the government itself. As far as the politics within it, I have a lot of opinions. And as far as Bernie Sanders is concerned, he's going to be in for a rude awakening when it comes to 2020, if he decides to run. Because I will not be behind him, and I doubt much of my comrades in the independent you know, side will be either. We're done with people just citing this over there. It's been over two years since the election. And ever since then, me, like, I'm, I'm pretty sure I'm not the only one that's been looped in. In fact, I know I'm not the only one. We've all been looped into supporting Putin, supporting Trump, even though we don't support either the Democrats or the Republicans, and we definitely don't support Russia. However, at least Russia is planning on trying to do something. And if the United States was so concerned about Russia and concerned about North Korea and concerned about nuclear arms, they would have signed the nuclear armistice to remove the nuclear weapons, but they didn't. So cut the crap. It's not about that you don't want you know, you don't like Russia. It's not about you don't like North Korea. It's just you want your name in the papers. You want your name to be, you know, there as long as possible. And as far as any sort of um, nefarious um, plans to start World War III, I see it. Call me a tinfoil hat enthusiast because I'm pretty sure I am. I, I probably am. But like I said, with Bernie, I already gave up on him when he decided to change sides. And, and, and that was a spit in the face to his supporters. And this is just a spit in the face to all of us in the independent scene that are, that are still fighting for him, fighting for him and, and people like him, you know, that are working basically within the, the monster of the mainstream to be able to, you know, fight for the truth and fight for what's real. You know, that's what I was hoping was happening until this went down. But now I see that it's not the case. I don't know if maybe he was bought off. Again, there may still be a situation where he's being, you know, manipulated because of something that happened to him, because of something that that he has over him or that they have over him. I don't know. But we'll just have to wait and see, I suppose. Okay, lastly, um, we're going to talk about the lack of empathy. I've already um, addressed it um, a little bit with the complacency when it comes to um, tragedies and how we're so e you know it's so easy to drop something and look at something else, something else that's shiny. But you have to understand that our minds are wired for sensory sensory perception. So if our minds are wired to sensory perception, then we need to be able to um, understand that people are, are going to show us something here. But as long as our senses are interacting with this, we may not see something else that's over there. You know, something else that's actually going on is over here. No, I'm looking here. I see the light over here. I see this over here. I'm going to go ahead and do whatever I need to do over here. But all the while, there's something else behind you or something else on the side of you, something on the other side of you going on. You can't see it. You can't tell. We as, you know, people, especially nowadays, we don't see much of anything behind, you know, that goes outside of our circle of interaction. And because of that, a lot of people don't want to really get involved. And that I understand the, the desire to not meddle. I understand the desire to focus on your priorities. I am the, you know, I am a fierce advocate for that. But when we continue to stay in our little bubbles, we don't see when the little guy is getting picked on. It's like, you know, when we were in high school and the, we, we, you know, just walked past the bully that's picking on somebody because we don't want to be next. Again, I understand the desire to not want to meddle, you not want to snitch, whatever, 
but that's not necessarily what I'm asking, you know, anybody to do. I don't think that anybody should be putting themselves in the line of fire, you know, but there's a difference between actively being involved in the situation that you don't understand and actively educating yourself and informing yourself about it. Because usually this is what happens when it comes to politics or anything else, religion. What happens is people say, I don't want to get involved. I don't want to talk about it. It's not really my thing. And then when a, um, let's say, a dumb Trump tweet or something nefarious that Congress had, a, a, another nefarious law that Congress has passed, they are all up in arms about how bad the administration is and how badly we need to impeach him and how badly this and badly that. Take your time that you are taking. You know, take the time that you are taking to whine and complain and learn about what's going on. Take time to learn about modern monetary theory and federal economics. Take time to learn about how the government has everything it needs to be able to fund what we need to stop whining and complaining about what Congress is doing to strip us. You know, you know, we can get upset about it, but once you do, until you understand what that really means, you can't really say anything about it. You can't really act like it affects you because it doesn't. Not really because you're just basically a sheep at this point. And I, I hate to use a, um, a, a tinfoil hat term, but when you follow something blindly without information and just say that this is the real truth, that's being led like a sheep. There's nothing really more to say about it. And I want to be able to stay in my own mindset that um, people can change and people can learn new things and people can, you know, just like I did, come from not really knowing anything and now being able to actively take part in political discussion because I know what's going on. You know, I did the work. I did the research. I'm not saying that you can't take part, but just know you're not going to know the whole story. You're not going to know the whole story if you take part without knowing what's going on. And we need to encourage more empathy. Take time to and, and more knowledge. Take time to learn about the other side. And if you know anything about the art of war. The more that you learn about your enemy, the better you are in being able to arm yourself against them. Sun Tzu. Feel free to read the book. Or you can just learn about critical thinking. When you are approached with something, you can't just take it at face value. You have to take a step back and be able to look at the whole picture. You have to look at it from both sides. Play devil's advocate. That's fine. But you can't sit here and act like you know everything. No one knows everything. I don't know everything. I don't. I don't claim to. You know, I'm I'm still learning. And in my in my humble opinion, we're here to learn. And we are here to engage with different beings and objects within our physical environment until we learn all we can and then we go. Of course, there may be other people that have different aspects of what death means and what things like that. That's not really what I'm talking, I'm trying to, you know, debate. But what I'm saying is that our purpose, you know, in our lives is to learn. In one way or another, because the human mind and, and body all, is always learning. Be, and the universe is always changing. That's physics. So we have to be able to adapt. If we can't adapt and we can't see that maybe someone else has another story to tell and someone has another 
point of view that you may not know about concerning a topic that you're passionate about and be able to, you know, basically like fact check, help you be able to understand more about what it is that you're talking about so that you're not being misunderstood and misled. I'm not Christian and I'm, again, I don't claim to be. I don't claim to be anything more than spiritual and eclectic in my own religious um, practice. But I follow the ways of the earth and the, when you give something to the earth, for example, you bury a dead body within the earth. It gives you life. We have the capability within ourselves to be able to transform what we're given. We don't just have to be given a, a, a plate of turds and that's just said. No, that's not how life works. We're able to take what we're given and turn it into something else. So if we take in what we have as far as this clusterfuck of things going on and we're able to transform it into positivity and, and forgive me if I seem like a hippie when I'm talking about this, but I'm, I'm, you know, you know, stay with me on this. If we change it into positivity and we, you know, take the negative energy that's coming from Trump, his, his, his cabinet, his supporters, Hillary supporters, Hillary herself, Bernie, whoever, if we, t if we take what is going on and we turn it into something positive, it's basically like planting a seed in the ground and you reap what you sow. So in my opinion, there's no reason to not, you know, look at every, you know, negative article, negative post, you know, whatever as a learning opportunity. Even if you don't agree with the person, wish them well. It will return to you. And if you feel like, you know, and, and even at the downturn of our own lives, because our lives are like a pendulum. So we have up times, we have down times. So when people put that on us, we're quick to just stay there. But the more you stay there, the less you're going to be able to enjoy when you're on your upswing. So when we are refusing to be empathetic towards someone, even someone that's done something terrible, like the shooter in Florida or Bernie, we have to be able to say, I wish you well. I may not know what's going on with you. I may not agree at all with what you've done. I may not, you know, want you around me, my family or anything. But I'll, I may not support you anymore, you know, as a candidate. But I know that you held promise for somebody at some point. You held joy for somebody at some point. Nobody's that, you know, there's very, it's very rare that somebody is so bad that from the beginning of their lives to the end of their lives, that they cause nothing but misery and pain to everyone. Somebody finds joy within that person. Somebody finds, you know, enlightenment, shall I say. But you don't have to love them. You just love them as a fellow human and move on with your life. You don't have to whine. You don't have to bitch and start shit. You don't have to fight them. You don't have to get the last word in. You don't have to tell them. You don't have to give them a piece of your mind. You don't have to tell them how you feel. Tell them why they're wrong. Shut up. You can shut the hell up, move on with your lives, and apply that energy to change. If you want real change, Apply your anger, your passion, and apply it to your life. 
Apply it to changing your local and state governments. Apply it to changing the point of view that you have towards your opponent. They are your opponent. But remember the tenets of good sportsmanship. True, this isn't a sport. But at the same time, in a way it is. It's a skill. And you have to be able to play the game. They're not playing the game by hating. As you can see in pictures, a lot of times you see Hillary, you know, and Clinton, and Bill Clinton, you know, laughing it up, socializing, rubbing elbows. They don't win by hating anybody. Remember, we have everything that we need to be able to change our own environments. And the more that you cut yourself off and the more that we separate ourselves, we're just doing exactly what they want. And we know it. You know, the, the moment that we are, you know, fighting amongst ourselves, the more that we're divided, the more that we're distracted, the more that they are winning. And we can't let them win. So do yourself a favor. May not be today, may not be tomorrow, may not be now, may not be whatever. Take time to understand your opponent. Take time to understand the killer. Take time to really learn. If you know that there's something in politics that you don't understand, if there's something in you know, whatever, your career that you don't understand, invest in yourself. I'm not saying invest in them. Invest in yourself. Invest in your own self-empowerment. Because that's what was is our own revolution. This is our revolution. To be able to be so strong within ourselves that they can't tear us down. They can try and defeat this. But they can't defeat this. They can't defeat this. They can't defeat my voice. They can't defeat your voice. They can try. But the second you stop trying to be better is where they win. Again, I'm sorry for the crappy audio and video feed earlier. I'm hoping that this one is going to turn out a little bit better. And if you guys like this one, please like and share. Please comment any um, video ideas that you have for me. Um, like I said, this is probably going to be the way I'm going to have to do it from now on until I'm able to have a better video and audio setup um, in the studio. But, um, yeah, that's it. So, um, yeah, uh, let me know what other ideas that you have. Um, comment any, any, um, any questions, any, um, comment your own opinions about these things because I would love to read it. Um, I may not be able to get to it quickly, but I will get to it as soon as I can. And you guys have a great rest of your evening. Bye.